They are icons of comedy and an American institution. Three characters that are part of the very fabric of popular culture. I ought to know, one of them was my father. Hello. Hello. Just how do you grapple with the fact that the apple never falls far from the tree? Well, it landed with a clunk, slap, plop, when it came to me. My source of frustration was my dad's occupation. He's a stooge. Oh, no, he gagged. Hey, Mo. Hey, Mo. Hey, Mo. Hey, Mo. Hey, Dad. I always hope to be an ordinary Joe, a face in the crowd, John Doe. But just my luck, I'm born son of Mo. I never knocked for my father, and it wouldn't be Mo if I had my brothers. And oh, by the way, take a look at his brothers. Hey, Mo. was always for real. It hit me with a bonk, boom, crash, is what it took to get me to feel. Well, now I ain't hiding and I'm swelling with pride, along for the ride and glad. So here's the three stooges story in all this knucklehead glory. It ain't just a passing fad, a hemo, hey Larry. In 1955, my father, Mo Howard, buried Shemp. Once again, Stooges Mo and Larry had lost their third partner as they had lost Curly to a debilitating stroke earlier. Columbia Pictures, the fans, even the Stooges themselves were not ready to finally say goodbye to the two real comedies. But that was easier said than done. A new stooge was needed, and Dad, still in mourning for his brothers, had to make the choice. Mo, just a reminder. I'll pay for three stooges, not two. He decided on an old friend of Shemp's, a comic with a big following and a well-known style and a man who was definitely not just another guy named Joe. Dad wasn't crazy. He knew what he was doing. Running away from home at 13 to join a traveling show, Besser's original ambition was to be a magician, but his tricks were no treat. Comedy was his true talent, and he became a vaudeville headliner, especially with his routine as a wimpy, whiny kid who drove everybody up the wall. Soon, he was making movies, including Abbott and Costello's safari spoof, Africa Screams, with his good buddy, Shemp Howard. It was with Bud and Lou that Besser achieved his greatest pre-stooge fame. Not me, him. I'll go get help. Well, you're such a nuisance. I grew up watching Joe Besser play Stinky on the Abbott and Costello show, and I knew how funny he was playing this big overgrown baby. I already liked him, 
and I always found him funny. Joe was the perfect fit, a proven audience favorite and already under contract to Columbia. He seemed to provide a seamless transition from the Shemp era shorts. A seamless transition? Sure, except for one small detail. One of Besser's vaudeville catchphrases had been, I'll harm you. But by the time he joined the Stooges, he obviously changed his tune. Ow! Oh, that hurts! That hurts! Shut up! Not so loud! What are you doing? Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Ow! Not so hard! Ow, that hurts! Go on! Not exactly a blueprint for unrestrained mayhem, is it? There's no doubt that the Stooges with Besser were a kinder and gentler trio. Oh, oh that hurts. I'm sorry, Joe. I'm sorry, Joe. I'm sorry, Joe. Can't you ever say anything like, I'm glad once? Yeah, so I'm glad I'm sorry once. That's better. He wouldn't take a beating. I didn't like that. Curly was like, you know, OK. You know, after he just got his, like, you know, are you going? I'm going. You know, after he just got beat up. But Joe was whiny and he wouldn't take a beating. It's like, you know, I won't participate. I never like to be hit with anything. And Larry used to say to me, don't worry, Joe, I'll take it. Now, that's the kind of guys they were. Quit acting like stooges. Please stop that nonsense and have your lunch so we can get started again. Now, the confrontations were far more verbal than physical. You get rid of that package, it's a right package, you hear me? Oh, he's mad. My dad wailed a lot more often than he walloped, which shifted his meanness to a new and strangely overbearing level. I, I think Joe also cross. suggested so that Mo and Larry comb their like hair back to look the more best. like Let's gentlemen and encourage them to trade in their blue collar overalls for business suits. Well, As a result, the these new Stooge comedies more closely resembled TV sitcoms than they did the shorts of the golden age. So, uh, and by this time, the mid-1950s, TV sitcoms were reflecting the new, upscale tastes of the prosperous post-war population, creating a bland, suburban world where nobody ever raised their voice, much less their fist. The style fit the Stooges like a tuxedo fits a gorilla. Plus, there was something else. Dad had always talked about Stooge comedy being rooted in the undoing of dignity. In the Depression world of the 1930s, giving the pompous and pampered rich their long overdue comeuppance was popular and politically correct. But in the paranoid Cold War 50s, when many believed that Hollywood was a hotbed of commie conspiracy, such sentiments could be seen as anti-capitalist and therefore socialist and subversive. And so, it's not surprising that the shorts of the Besser era never really suited Dad and Larry, though it wasn't for a lack of trying. Joey, darling! Sugar plum! It was not perhaps the ideal match. To me, it always breaks down to the fact that Joe Besser was not curly. Shemp even suffered from the comparison. Although he was a funny man, I think he was out of place in the short. So they basically had to plug him into the third Stooges role. I would have hated to have been the guy that had to play center field for the Yankees when Mickey Mantle retired. Good luck. Bobby Mercer did a great job, but he wasn't Mickey Mantle. Joe Besser was not as well known as either Curly or Shemp. He was a different kind of comedian with a very different style. I think a lot of fan reaction was initially somewhat negative because it was such a stark contrast from what was there before. Viewing the two reelers of this period reveals that the magic was slipping and that the laughs were stalling and that it just didn't seem like fun anymore. Plus, they were spending less and less on producing the shorts. Some of the shorts are funny, but Besser looks out of place in them. He doesn't look like he really belongs. 
you know, he fancied himself as a vaudevillian that was going to be a comedic star on his own. And uh, so he seemed to be a satellite. He was satelliting around them. He made a big mess, you know, with eggs. And, and uh, he takes a flamethrower. And, and that's all funny and everything. But it was him doing a solo show. They were turning them out so quickly. And they were mostly either remakes uh, with stock footage or, uh, or, or hodgepodges by that time, the late, late 50s. Uh, but I always liked Joe. He was instrumental in helping him get through that time period. And some of the shorts that he did are great shorts and, and considered very, very well among the fan base. Oh, darling, the Besser I'm comedies sorry. did indeed have their own special I'm charm. All settled. You can give us all Just right. consider, for example, Merry Mix-Up, a brilliant concoction concerning three mismatched sets of triplets that would have done a master of mistaken identity like Shakespeare proud. Brother! Oh, this brother! Brother! Oh, this gets worse by the minute. Or Hoofs and Goose. Why, sis, it is you. I'd know those ears anywhere. Oh, Larry, gosh, I'm happy. A bizarre story about, <laughs> and I kid you not, a reincarnated horse. See it? Bernie, Bernie, you, you, you're reincarnated. You, you've come back. But, Bertie, you're, you're a horse. So who did you expect? Kim Novak? Oh. The writing was really good in those, and, and they brought in a lot of current event topics. Television, space race was just beginning. The Stooges even satirized the 1950s sci-fi craze when they took on Amazon women in outer space and spaceship sappy. Oh yes, these films were unusual, and inventive, and outlandish. And they were also weird, which is generally not the result you're looking for in comedy. So what went wrong? Well, the reasons are many, and most of them have to do with the Stooges themselves. To begin with, Joe Besser, the new stooge, never really meshed all that well with the old ones. And speaking of old, at this point, my father and Larry were pushing 60. Dad, in fact, was soon going to be pulling it. And yet, they were still playing the same roles they had in the 30s. Like those Depression era characters, they were still usually unemployed. Mo, you should be looking through the one ads for a job. Still usually unmarried, and still usually living together, and still almost always acting like overgrown children. There's something just not as funny about watching old guys do slapstick, you know? It's just like you worry about them instead of laugh. And by the time they're in their 60s, you know, they're, they just, it's just not as funny. It was all a little strange and a little sad as well. And all the business suits and slick back hair and all the clever plots and unexpected twists couldn't hide the sneaking suspicion that the parade had passed the Stooges by. What happened? Now, my father had been leading that knucklehead procession for an awfully long time. And it's never easy for a performer to admit that the day to finally put away those marching shoes might be drawing near. After all, nobody wants to believe that it's going to rain on their parade. But Mo the Stooge was a realist. And he could see those gray clouds hanging in the sky. For my dad and for the Stooges, the world was changing and they were trying their best to change with it. And while many fans now see the Joe Besser comedies as a pale imitation of what had gone before, they did inject new life into an aging franchise that was frankly running out of steam. And with Besser, the Stooges enjoyed an uptick in box office receipts and in audience appeal. Of course, in the end, all of that didn't matter, not one little bit. Oh. 
it didn't matter because by the late 50s, the previously invincible studio system was finally breaking down. New economic realities meant big cutbacks, and among the casualties were theatrical short subjects. Shorts were no longer the big audience draw in the movie theaters, especially with the advent of TV. One by one, the major studios dropped them until Columbia stood alone, holding on to the hope that these relics of another era could still prove profitable. Well, that hope didn't last forever. On December 20th, 1957, The Three Stooges completed their 190th Columbia two-reeler. It was a series that had made them kings of short-form comedy, with the very name of the act entering pop culture as a synonym for outrageous ineptitude. They had entertained millions with their inspired insanity and had made millions for their employers with their relentless hard work. And now, like the characters in one of their comedies, they were about to get the bum's rush. <laughs> Columbia, citing rising costs and declining interest in theatrical short films, informed Moe, Larry, and Joe that their contracts would not be renewed. They film their last short, they go back to their dressing room, and guess what? You're done. Just like that, a glorious run of 23 years was over. The pink slip, delivered in the midst of the holiday season, came without a ticker tape parade, without a set of statues on the studio lot, without even, as far as I know, a gold watch to honor the men who had won fame and fortune for a once small and struggling operation. No, there was none of those things. Just some cold words and the sound of a closing door. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. A couple of weeks into that new year, Mo Howard, the legendary leader of the equally legendary Three Stooges, drove over to the studio to say goodbye to a few old friends. This was a man who had been instrumental in creating a new form of film comedy. This was a man whose face was as familiar to movie fans as Harry Cohn's Statue of Liberty logo, and a man who had helped Columbia survive the grim days of the Great Depression. And now, this was a man who was turned away from the studio gate because his entry pass had expired. The cliché had come to pass. Insult had been added to injury. And now my father was little more than an outcast, a stranger in his own land. In his almost five decades in show business, Dad had suffered his share of hard knocks, and he had always managed to land on his feet. But this was different. This wasn't some pothole on the road to success. This was a chasm the size of the Grand Canyon, a bottomless pit that could swallow a career in the blink of an eye. Yes, the winner of the Stooges' discontent had arrived, and spring looked like it was never going to come. But there was one last irony to consider before the fall. An odd twist of fate accompanied Dad's departure from Columbia Pictures. About two months after my dad lost his job, studio founder Harry Cohn, often called the most hated man in Hollywood, lost his life, falling victim to a fatal heart attack. Harry's send-off might have been even more cynical than Moe's. The funeral was extremely well attended, and comic Red Skelton, who had worked for Cohn, was asked why so many people would show up at the services for such a universally despised individual. It just proves what Harry always said, replied Skelton. Give the people what they want, and they'll come out for it. That's Hollywood for you, all heart. 
In that bleak winter of 1958, Dad, dismissed and disgraced, was finding out just how hard that heart could be. What do we do now, both individually and collectively, because this is all they ever, their entire professional life had been as performers. With the Columbia contract ended, my father looked in the mirror and saw an aging, unemployed comedian. And he saw as well that the man looking back at him might have no other choice but retirement. The Three Stooges are over, kid. Ancient history. They're dead. And so Dad started worrying about money. Actually, that's not true. Dad always worried about money. He had already, a few years before, right around the time of Shemp's death, sold our dream house in Toluca Lake, moving us into a modest apartment. I guess he sensed that bad times were ahead. And now, the bad times were here. Dad had a few investments, and also owned several buildings, though, as landlords go, my father was a notoriously soft touch. One tenant felt so guilty about Moe's refusal to increase the rent that he actually raised his own rent. And in a way, that sums up Dad's attitude about money. He was insecure about never having enough, and yet could be an easy mark, as I found out when I was a teenager. One Sunday afternoon, my mother and father decided they wanted to give me some extra driving practice. They said, let's go to San Diego. So we hop in our 1947 Studebaker Champion. I'm sitting on a cushion so I can see over the steering wheel, and away we go. We're driving about halfway there, and it's a divided highway with a cement island separating the directions of traffic. I'm cruising along about 25, 30 miles an hour, approaching an intersection, when suddenly somebody cuts left right in front of me, and then I cut in the other direction to try to avoid him going into oncoming traffic. I'm dodging oncoming traffic, and then I jump over the divider coming back, and suddenly things begin to slow down. My mother is rolling back and forth in the back seat like a bowling ball. My father is patting me on the shoulder. Good boy, Paul. Good boy, Paul. Then suddenly things seem to speed up and I'm trying to avoid traffic going in my direction and I slowly pull over to the curve and stop. And another car pulls over and stops. And the guy gets out and he says, hey buddy, I saw where that guy went. He went just behind the parking lot in that, by that supermarket over there. And I know he's there now. That's all my dad needed to know. He says, let me take care of this. So we drive around. My mother says, please Mo, be careful, be careful. He gets out of the car. Sure enough, in the distance, we see that car parked with some guy slumped down behind the seat. Dad strolls over to the car. I can kind of see what's going on. I can kind of hear what's going on. I see him gesticulating wildly. I can hear him swearing. It takes about a minute, minute and a half. Suddenly, he wheels around and comes back, and my mom says, what did you do? What did you do? Dad says, his wife's in the hospital, and he's out of work. And I slipped them a 20. It all added up to a surprising truth. Mo Howard, movie star, was not a wealthy man and was staring at a tough and frugal future. The situation was even worse for Larry. The loss of the Columbia dollars was pushing him close to bankruptcy. And for the wild-haired Mr. Fine, work still meant being a stooge. And so partly out of loyalty to longtime pal Larry, and partly out of loyalty to his own wallet, and partly because Dad was always a performer to the bone, my father decided to hit the road one more time for a series of personal appearances. He approached Joe Besser with an idea. They were inundated with offers for personal appearances. Besser could not travel. Family health situation precluded him from traveling. Besser's wife was not well, and he didn't want to be away from her. So Joe left the act. 
And for the third time in 12 years, Dad and Larry found themselves a duo rather than a trio, with no real prospects and no real plans. And they also found themselves living in an America that perhaps no longer had room for the Three Stooges. The glorious innocence of the post-war boom was fading, and in just a few years, many one-time Stooge fans would become embroiled in the turmoil of Vietnam, the civil rights movement, social protest, and the sexual revolution. Did anybody really still have time for three imbeciles who batted each other silly? And me? Well, I was just a 22-year-old kid, fresh out of college, confronting time on Uncle Sam's payroll as a member of the United States Army. I wanted to help, of course, but what could I do? No, it didn't seem as if anyone or anything could change the grim fact that the final act had seemingly played itself out and that the Stooges would now be no more than a memory. Such a slow here, enemy. I am the doctor, is it? But salvation was about to arrive from two very unlikely sources. The first entered the picture by the pale glow of a cathode ray tube. That's right, TV. The very medium that had helped wreck the Stooges' movie career was now ironically coming to the rescue. If you were lucky enough to grow up in the New York metropolitan area in the late 1950s and early 1960s, this man was your true and trusty friend. He was known to kids of all ages as Officer Joe Bolton, and he arrested your attention with an after-school surprise that was a lot more fun than homework because he brought you the Stooges. As in almost every city, there were local kitty show hosts. And in New York, uh, one of the uh, stalwarts was Officer Joe Bolton on WPIX and he hosted and introduced the Three Stooges. I have these memories of, you know, coming home after school and sitting with Joe Bolton and the Three Stooges, and I did not know. See, I, <laughs> I didn't know that they had done stuff way, way before. I had no clue. I thought these were like guys up the block. And every now and then, they even came to the studio and would make personal appearances on the show. That was really exciting. And even though he became the most famous of the Stooge TV hosts by virtue of broadcasting in New York, he certainly wasn't alone. My father was doing mostly radio work at the time. He was a top 10 DJ in Los Angeles for many, many years. KTTV in Los Angeles called him and asked him to come in and audition for this new TV show they were going to do. It would be a live show five nights a week. We'd like you to audition for the host. We went on at prime time. And we did good. They did good. The Stooges themselves came on a couple of times, ran a contest on the show, and a little gal won. And we took her, I took her to dinner, she and her family, and got up in the middle, made a phone call, we're sitting there, and pretty soon here comes this guy and he sits down beside her, and he goes, Whoosh. it was Larry. And she went, ah! He just came from home and surprised her. It was marvelous. By about 1960, there were 156 local stations airing the two reelers, to the delight of fans, young and old, from coast to coast. We used to watch the Stooges on TV. This was back when we lived in Cleveland, Ohio. They were on a show with a guy called Captain Penny. He used to show the Three Stooges. I had a, a longing to be near that kind of dynamic, to try to understand it, to try, try to somehow be a part of it and learn from it. There was something about Officer Joe Bolton. I don't know why, but I, I got him. I understood him. And in the afternoon after school, he presented the Three Stooges. And I, I can't explain why they appealed to me. I can't explain what the connection was, but I was connected to them. Like, I got them. I just knew that these were my guys, and so I would watch them 
and just have fun, you know? I have tried to imitate the whoop, 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 whoop. I've tried, I'm not gonna lie. I can do this part of it. I can't do the cheek finger roll. That's difficult to do. Billy West is a master at it. No, 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 no. Sweet me. Sometimes in the dark of night, in my mind, I hear myself humming. And I know that they're around. I know that they're around me, so. All across the country, there were shows dedicated to delivering the Three Stooges to kids who hadn't even been born when the boys were in their heyday. And while the hosts of these programs, Sherry Lewis, Jerry Mahoney, and Sally Starr, among so many others, were unknowns at the time. They were about to ride a tidal wave of celebrity that no one could have predicted. So how did all this happen? And how had those famous comedy shorts made their way into the small screen? Well, in January 1958, right after the studio had given the boys the boot, Screen Gems, Columbia's TV arm, released 78 of the old comedies to television as part of a syndication package. Columbia released the pictures on TV. Then it really went sky high. You mean you had more popularity on television than you did on the screen? Oh, yes. Their exposure on television basically brought them to an entire new audience who had not seen their films necessarily in the theaters. And the, the, the renaissance and explosion of their popularity to new generations just exploded. When their contract ended, uh, they really didn't know what they were going to do. And it really wasn't until they had a positive, a huge positive reaction from television audiences that they were back. They were, they were not only back, they were more popular than ever. Very quickly, early positive feedback grew into a full-fledged phenomenon. Cities began recording astronomical ratings. Larry's old stomping grounds, Philadelphia, delivered an astounding 33.3 number. I was eight years old when they made their big TV debut, when the old films were sold to television in 1959. And I was a TV junkie in those days, and I got hooked immediately. They showed the Three Stooges before we went to school in the morning. They showed the Three Stooges at like 7 a.m. I was just getting up, and, and here are these guys on TV. I mean, I learned my life's lessons, not from school, from these episodes. I learned how people interacted, and I learned the truth of acting. Hey, in 1960, I had my first child, and when Darren was a baby, I would be ironing, washing, and in the background, I'd all of a sudden see the Three Stooges on television. And it was like, like something I had never seen before, because I went through many, many years of really not seeing them. Hit me when I wasn't looking, eh? And then it would be, oh my God, that's my father again. The shorts were perfect for television. You can show two or three episodes and make it a regular hour show for, for kids or for adults to watch. And that's exactly what happened. And, and uh, <laughs> in television syndication, those shorts showed domestically in the United States as well as all over the world. Perhaps this overwhelming reaction wasn't quite as surprising as it seemed to be. One reason for it was pointed out by my father who understood a fundamental truth about television. You couldn't get a, a five-year-old kid to, in, into the theater yeah. and have them enjoy anything. So you can see the, the advantage of, uh, of television. It cut the youngsters at home. We were, we were, our pictures were the finest babysitters in the, in the country. <laughs> of course, the Stooges were so much more than just electronic nannies. Those Golden Age shorts were little comedic gems, still as fresh and funny as the day they were made. Older audiences now had a nostalgic reminder of long lost laughs, and kids were making the acquaintance of some very amusing guys. 
And despite complaints from several parents' groups citing the negative impact of signature stooge mayhem, in response, my dad pointed out that the typical two-wheeler was far less violent than your average Western. And so the Stooges basked in a lot of newfound fame, and Columbia banked a lot of newfound loot. The studio, which subsequently released another 40 shorts to cash in on the craze, reportedly made $12 million from this TV revival. Mo and Larry, however, didn't see a dime of it. Now, did you guys get any money at all from after you gave up making the pictures and they ended up going on television? No, nothing. Now, you see, when we signed the contract with Columbia, there was no TV. No, I'll tell you, uh, there was a very, uh, very <laughs> mean clause in the contract, which I learned and never have forgotten. And it's... Uh, it's it was worded like this. It said, Columbia Pictures Corporation has the perpetual rights to your likenesses, your voices, and mediums now known or to be invented. Wow. How do you like that? Nobody could get residuals. It was only in pictures made after 1960. Oh. But while the Stooges' sudden TV stardom didn't make them rich, thanks to guys like Officer Joe and Don Lamond, it did launch a renaissance that was as unstoppable as it was unexpected, as the trio's fortunes rose like a rocket. And from then on, it just became history, you know. We, back we came again right to the top of the heap. And unexpected is also the word for the second unlikely source of support I mentioned earlier. It arrived in the form of an ally who would turn a cliché on its ear. Because you see, in this case, the wife's dad was about to get a helping hand from his son-in-law. As I said earlier, Norman Moore, my sister Joan's husband, actually began his service to the Stooges' cause before he officially became my brother-in-law with his series of comic books that were still going strong long after their debut in the 1940s. And now, Norman was about to be called upon to transfer his talents from pen and brush stooges to flesh and blood ones. The gifted Mr. Moore was poised to take on a major role in the family business. Norman Moore was a genius and a good friend. Got along really well with Norman. Tried to get him out of the office from time to time. He was a workaholic. God, he would work constantly, day and night. Brilliant. Brilliant mind, great cartoonist. My dad realized Norman had the abilities of coming out of comics to do writing, directing, art direction, whatever. And he was able to then take the Stooges and bring them through another decade or two. Dad trusted him and admired his can-do attitude. Norman had an ability to look beyond present problems and see future possibilities. And this optimism was essential because in those dark and depressing post-Columbia days of 1958, the good ship stooge had hit a reef. In the 40s, there were many theaters converting from single feature to double feature. And with a double feature and a Disney cartoon and a newsreel, there was no room for the Three Stooge comedy. Although we continued to make them right along, and they were going into foreign countries and through the South and Midwest where they were still showing single features. We were never out of action, complete action, either in films or in personal appearances. So as winter turned into spring, my dad decided to roll the dice one more time. Remember when we last left Mo and Larry? There weren't three stooges, only two. There was a need for a little addition after the subtraction. And if one Joe was on his way out, well, why not bring another one in? It all started when Larry took in a Las Vegas review called Minsky's Follies. Norman had suggested that Larry check out a certain roly-poly comic 
And soon... Hello, Mo. This is your pal, Larry. Mr. Fine was on the phone with Mr. Howard, telling him that he had just might have found the missing third stooge. My agent called me and told me that the stooges were looking for somebody, and if I, was, if I come in from Vegas for a overnight trip, why we would get together and talk about it and find out who's, who's who and what's what. The gentleman in question was Joe Dorita, a savvy veteran of vaudeville and radio. I was uh, raised in show business. I have my mother and father in it. I've been in it since I was seven and a half. And uh, I was done everything, vaudeville, nightclubs, tent shows, tent medicine shows. Unlike the previous Stooges, he wasn't Jewish, but like all the Stooges past and present, he could make people laugh. He too was an experienced comedian, and uh, uh, he was funny uh, when they would do the old skits on the Ed Sullivan Show, Maha, Aha, he was very good. I met with uh, Larry and Mo, and uh... We talked it over and it sounded good and I just insisted that I don't try to imitate Curly. I just wanted to be myself. So they made a deal and opened in a Bakersfield nightclub in October of 1958. And they <laughs> stunk up the place. Dad was convinced that this new Joe just didn't have the right stuff for stoogedom. But Dad and Larry stuck it out, reworked the material, and got Dorita to shave his head and dub himself Curly Joe. The only problem with Curly Joe was that he wasn't Curly. And so this constant exposure to the, to the great two realists of the 30s and 40s on TV every day made it hard to fully embrace Joe Dorita when you were comparing them side by side, almost literally side by side. Somehow, some way, magic happened. The act began to work. And even if Curly Joe wasn't Curly, after all, who could be? The fans now, so eager to welcome the Stooges back, took the new trio into their hearts. Their next engagement in Pittsburgh was the most successful one any combination of Stooges had ever enjoyed. When they came to Pittsburgh and they saw all these people at the station, they wondered who the VIP was on the train, not realizing the crowds were for them. They had absolutely no idea of how popular they were. Held over for three weeks, playing to packed houses, it was the turning point in the Stooges' return to the big time. Among the great comedy names of our time are three men who for many years convulsed the motion picture and vaudeville audiences of this country with their hilarious knock em about style of comedy. It took the medium of television and the perceptive minds of today's youngsters to rediscover their greatness. So here from three record-breaking weeks at the Holiday House in Pittsburgh are, let's welcome them, the Three Stooges! <laughs> Now, with hot ticket live performances and with the popularity of their old films on television, these so called has beens were back and back with a vengeance. Authors began pouring in for an act that less than a year before had been considered an artifact better suited to an antique store than to a stage. And think about this. In 1959, the Stooges were going to make more money than they ever had during their Columbia heyday, about four times as much. All this dizzying success after years of steady decline had a rejuvenating effect on my father. To a very great degree, it vindicated him, proving that he had been doing something right all along, in spite of all the naysayers. The Stooges had been his life and his life work, his art and his craft, 
And I know that after the Columbia firing, he had felt like a failure, forgotten and unappreciated, with a career as dead as a dodo bird. Now, however, he was part of the greatest comeback in show business history, bigger than Sinatra's, bigger than Travolta's, bigger than anything. F. Scott Fitzgerald once famously remarked that there are no second acts in American life. Obviously, Fitzgerald wasn't much of a Stooges fan. And quite frankly, at this point in my life, I wasn't that much of a Stooges fan either. And I had mixed emotions about this sudden and dramatic turnabout in Stooge fortunes. On the one hand, of course, I was thrilled for Dad and Larry. They had worked so hard all their lives and had been in so many ways treated so badly. If anyone had earned another trip to the top of the heap, if anyone deserved another day in the bright sun of success, it was them. And I knew that all the attention and fame made my father proud and allowed him to feel like a big shot again. But on the other hand, I had never really come to terms with the idea of having a famous father. Had never really accepted being part of an entertainment dynasty. I had never embraced the glory and the grief of being a stooge kid. And now, in 1958, with the two reelers gone, I thought that it was finally over, that the stooges were finally finished and that I could finally just be a part of an ordinary family. Boy, was I wrong. And as 1958 turned into 1959, all this acclaim brought an ironic invitation. Columbia Pictures, which had so recently and so unceremoniously shown the Stooges the door, now came calling with a proposition. How would you fellas like to be in the movies? What goes around really does come around, doesn't it? Well, yes, it does. That's marvelous. Keep it up now, boys. Somebody got and now the comeback was complete. The boys, so recently just a bunch of washed up victims of circumstance, were going back home, going back to Columbia going back to the movie screens that had made them so famous. Get another channel. Wait, let's see what happens. And as we shall see next time, the movies would be just the beginning.